Hello, welcome to our program. My name is Tom Barrett. I'm president of the Dearborn Genealogical Society. This year, 2006, marks the 40th anniversary of our society. To celebrate this milestone, we invite you to join a group of our members and friends and have them tell you what genealogy has meant to us. love history? Do you love a really good story? How about a story with a heartwarming ending? Like surprises? We interviewed several members of the Dearborn Genealogical Society to learn about their journeys into the world of genealogy. Every member has an important family story, and here's a special one. This is the tale of one person who by simply searching for her family roots, in this case looking for the site of a family farm, served as the catalyst to right a 137-year wrong. Here's Linda Eufer's story. I went to the little town about 10 miles away where I thought my great-great-great-grandfather's farm was located based on our plat maps that we had. And I went into, uh, mind you, this town had a very small population of about 500, and I went into the gas station slash coffee shop and there were five men sitting around chatting and I introduced myself and said, I'm looking for uh, the Linus Dowd farm and possibly the cemetery on this farm. Later that week I called the lady whose name I had been given, the wife of one of the men, and she said, well, I know where the cemetery is. So we got together again, came in another direction, walked through uh, brush and bramble and across fields and Along with her were two members of the Defiance County Genealogical Society. When he got back to the ravine in the woods, there were two uh, headstones. What I failed to tell you was one of the men had said to me on the way out on the first day, are you aware that the Dowd brothers were deserters from the Civil War? And I said no, and it made me feel kind of badly. So fast forward to when we walked back and actually found the stones, they were military issued markers, which made me think that they must not have been deserters. Well, that was the fall of 1994, as I said, and nothing else was done. We kept in contact through uh, email and visiting each other, and then in the spring of 2000, she called me and she said, um, will you be available in October for uh, a ceremony? And I said, what are you talking about? Well through the two people that had accompanied us back to the, the grave sites, they had told their society, uh, the county society, and they were trying to reclaim abandoned cemeteries. So the president had done lots of research, and through her research she found a veteran's pension file that said one of the brothers had died at his aunt's, and through researching an uh, 1863 newspaper, there was an article about the other brother. He had been on an authorized leave from his service when from Indiana came two or three volunteers and they thought he was a deserter. They were gonna pick him up and take him wherever. Well, when he resisted, they shot him and he died the next day. The two brothers died within six months of each other and they were buried back on this family cemetery and those are the two names that we found on those uh, markers. So after all that research she contacted the VFW of that county and they decided to make a service project out of cleaning up the grounds, cleaning up the gravesite, and had a rededication ceremony. So in October of 2001 the cemetery was rededicated and new, the old stones were put down and now the, the brand new stones from the government. And it said in the paper when they were describing this, it took 137 years to dispel the rumor of the Dowd brothers deserting 
their Civil War service. So the Dowd brothers were my great great uncles and none of this would have ever happened had I not become interested in genealogy in 1994. We asked some of our members how they became interested in family history. My father used to love to tell the stories t to me about the early days in the 1800s with my brother and I sitting at his knee listening. He would talk about his father who was deputy sheriff at the Sioux for 25 years and of the many criminals that he arrested up there. Uh, there were so many things that were of interest to us that when dad died in 1967, I took a look at it and I said, there's no one here to tell those stories any longer. I had always been interested, but when I taught genealogy merit badge, I said, you know, hey, it's uh, the, the time's going here. You need, to, you need to do the things that you're teaching these boys. I got started in genealogy probably too late in my life. Uh, uh, after, shortly after the death of my father, and I was in my 50s, wow. <laughs> I, I got some computer software and I went on the internet and I got more information and I've, I just got into it. Well, you, genealogists become kind of addicted to their uh, hobby. When Tom was to retire, we wanted to do something to, in genealogy. And when I found out I'm the 10th great granddaughter of William White, who came on the Mayflower, and that drew my desire. My grandfather in his later years liked to talk about his family. So uh, I recorded him doing this, luckily. And then uh, I went to a computer show one time and picked up a program to start entering information in my computer. Some of us were surprised by what we learned. When the Arnots left Scotland in the year 1828 to, uh, to come to Canada, they had 11 children and they boarded the brig dispatch and had an uneventful trip until they got off of the coast of Newfoundland around July the 10th. And in heavy seas, they ran into a great big rock off the coast of Newfoundland, right about where the Titanic went down. And they were unable to launch any lifeboats as the seas were too heavy. The only way they could abandon the ship was by throwing a lifeline over the side, down onto the rock, and pulling it tight, and going down hand over hand onto the rock. When my great-great-grandmother, Catherine Ferguson Arnott's came, turn came, she had an apron on, and she had a baby, and she placed the baby in her apron, took that apron, clenched it tightly between her teeth on the corners, and then she and the baby went down that hand line, hand over hand, until they arrived down on the rock. That family of 13 stayed on that rock with the rest of the survivors for six days and nights until they were finally rescued on, gee, the seventh day. And they were picked up by a passing ship, taken to Halifax for a few days, and from there, they were taken to Quebec, Canada, their original destination. Things must have worked out well, for after their arrival, great-great-grandmother had a, their 12th child on, in 1830. I've got letters that my, uh, her father wrote to his mother. I've got about, oh, 10 letters in his handwriting that that I didn't know anything about until I started doing research. I found these letters that my grandfather wrote to his mother uh, by going, we visited a, some friends in Flint area and uh, the relative just gave the letters to me. She didn't really want them and so I took them home. I've made copies of them, but uh, they're all in the original handwriting of my grandfather. And there are letters that he wrote to his mother. I have a couple of letters that she wrote to him, which was kind of interesting. And uh, I mean, he talks to her son like we talk to our kids nowadays, and this is back in the 1800s, you know. It's, times have not changed. 
my uh, cousin had told me that he had gotten into the Sons of the American Revolution and with the records that I was eligible to join the DAR. And I always wanted to be in the Daughters of the American Revolution. So uh, that kind of got me hooked and then I started branching out and tracing my grandmother's family who goes all the way back to, to, uh, to the Mayflower. And um, I don't know, I just kept on going and then I started doing Romero's. Well, I uh, found out because of Wanda researching uh, the uh, archives, and uh, it was very interesting. I never knew that, you know, you could go back that far. The most surprising thing I found out was uh, about the story about my great-grandfather getting killed by the Indians, and my grandmother closing the door and saved herself. We've gone together to Mexico to do research in the archives. And uh, we went last year just to copy one single book. And all the way down there to copy a book and copy the book and came back. But you kind of get kind of crazy when you do genealogy. <laughs> when I began to work on my paternal grandmother who came from Quebec, and uh, I began to plow through all of the French records, many, many wonderful names. Uh, Seraphine Thomas de Tranchementin, Hippolyte Sauvé. And strangely enough, um, as I moved along, I found three names that sounded quite peculiar Abigail Nims, Josiah Rising, and Sarah Hansen. And I thought, Sarah Hansen? What happened here? Well, I learned soon enough through the research that these were children of New England settlers who were captured by Indians and carried to Quebec, never to return home. Sarah Hansen, on the other hand, was a 14-year-old girl living in Dover, New Hampshire, and she was taken uh, when 13 Indians showed up at their home one August day in 1714. They packed up her 12-year-old sister Elizabeth, her six-year-old brother Ebenezer, and her mother, who had a two-week-old baby in her arms, and th this little group was walked uh, more than 200 miles over the White Mountains to Montreal. Their father, uh, John Hansen, converted all his possessions into gold, and with the help of the British, he was able to ransom the family members, all but Sarah, who was hidden, and they refused to bring her out for uh, exchange. Uh, in order to gain her freedom, she uh, married a uh, man from the military there, Jean-Baptiste Sabarine, and it is from their son, uh, Paul Sabarine, that I find my line. Yes, sometimes we find out we're descended from interesting and distinguished people. We always bragged about his great-great-great-grandfather was the last surviving veteran of the Revolutionary War, and he talked about him all the time. This man lived to be 114 and seven months old. He was quite a character. But um, after my dad passed away, I realized I didn't know anything about his mother's side of the family. So I went to the library in Crawfordsville, Indiana, where she lived, where she had lived, and there was a girl there helped me. And I was looking for information on the bundles. That's B-U-N-N-E-L-L. -L. And um, we're probably distant cousins somewhere along the line because she knew just where to look. She was related to the Bunnels too. <laughs> so she gave me some books to copy some stuff and she went off and made copies for me just to hurry things along. So after I came back home, I started reading all this and um, there was a chapter called The Washington Connection. And I was reading about George Washington and wondering why is this included? Well, then I start figuring things out and found out that I'm his first cousin, six times removed. So that was quite, quite a thing to find out. <laughs> Winfield Arneson and I had a little conversation and I said, you know, there's somebody in the, one of the commandants that has the same last name as is in my family genealogy. I don't know if we're related. And he said, oh, find out if we are and let me know. So the next time the Dearborn Genealogy Society had a trip to Fort Wayne, that's where I went. And I put the names in 
and I got this little teeny tiny skinny book. I thought, gee, what's going to be in here? And it opened up into like eight pages big. And there was my line down to people that I knew I continued from. And there was Henry's line, General Henry Whiting. And so now I know how I'm related to him. I'm like a fifth cousin and fourth time, four times removed to his father's side and a fifth cousin five times removed twice on his mother's side because they married second cousins. So I'm related to the man three times. Sometimes a special photo tells part of our family story. My maternal great-grandparents, um, Hosea T. Rust and his wife, uh, Maria Clifford Rust. Um, it was made around 1912. Um, and it must have been an anniversary picture because they were married in the 1870s. Um, and they lived in um, the area around Paragould, Arkansas. The women are the carriers of tales. The women seem to write, the men might write letters, but the women seem to have the story. So I started with going back in a direct female line. Um, and my, my goal was to find information and pictures to go directly back in a fem female line. And so, of course, I started with myself. These are both high school graduation pictures. And then I went back, uh, Bessie Lamport, who was born in Pontiac and died in Royal Oak. And she, her mother was Caroline Kirkland Connor of the um, early Connors family of Detroit. She married, um, she was, well, she married a Lamport who was from New York. She was born in Detroit on Farmer and Monroe. And her mother was Adeline Doty Connor. Adeline came with her mother, Ruth, and the rest of her family across New York State, settled in Detroit by, they were in Detroit by 1825. I brought a picture of my great-grandparents, uh, Robert Lyle Palmer and his wife, who was born Margaret Ferguson Scott. Um, they have several connections to me even though I never really, I never met them. They died before I was born. Um, the first and most direct connection, I guess, would be that their, their middle daughter out of their five was my grandmother. Um, and when I asked questions about uh, my dad's side of the family, she was the one I asked them to. And when she died, a lot of her pictures and notes and things were passed on to me. So I became the family chronicler or family history nut, you know. Or sometimes there's a family story about a special photo. This is a picture of my great-grandmother. And uh, this picture was lost from our family for quite a few years. And my uncle had obtained this picture after my grandmother had died. And then he moved to Farwell, Michigan. And we never knew what happened to the picture. But one day my brother, Elmer Jr., was a repairman for Michigan Bell. And he was repairing the phone on Beach Street, which was next door to where my uncle lived. And he casually mentioned that my uncle, his uncle Niles, had lived there. And so his neighbor said, Oh, the lady found a picture up in the attic, and on the back of it is inscribed Niles's grandmother. So he said, Well, you fix my phone, I will go and talk to the lady about it. So he went next door, and he came back to my brother, and he said, She will give you the picture. And this is a picture that always hung in my grandmother's sunroom. Now it hangs up in uh, my sister, my brother has passed away and my sister-in-law has it framed above her mantle in her house and it's really a treasure. Family heirlooms have a special significance for people who love family history. I have an autograph book that my great-grandmother Mary Amanda Marsh gave to her daughter Gertrude Ann Marsh and she said may your life be always happy and your smile be just as gay as the lilies of the valley when they bloom in lovely May. Well, I have uh, three bracelets that my, my aunt uh, Pearl Margaret Dunn, she was a gray girl, also gave me, or left for the girls, and I, they came to me. And it's really exciting having these old bracelets from the early 1900s or maybe it was 1800s, I don't know where, where they came from, but they're mine now. I have a family tree, and it is of John and Christina Bencher, and they lived in Spruce, Wisconsin on a farm and had 13 children. 
This family treasure, known to Ruth Rhodes' family as the Revolutionary War Spoon, was saved when the British were looting Peekskill in Westchester County, New York. The British are coming, the British are coming. My grandmother left a little note with the spoon which said, her great-great-grandmother uh, secreted the spoons beneath the baby in the cradle. We learn a lot about history when we investigate our family stories. I was able to find out a lot of information about orphanages and how orphans were treated in the state of Michigan uh, because my mother was an orphan at, at four months old. Uh, there was no social net, social security net uh, to take care of children. Uh, the, the, her siblings, the, the boys that, that were her siblings, were actually put into a mental institution and they, they were uh, sent to Lapeer and unfortunately the only way that they could get out was to agree to be neutered um, and then they were released. Consequently I have no cousins from her side of the family. My father-in-law who passed away in 1965, he was actually in the First World War. He went into the First World War when he was 17 and he served in the Rainbow Division uh, under uh, I forget the general's name at, the, at this point, but uh, I've been able to do quite a bit of reading on the Rainbow Division and all the, the battlefronts that they were involved in. And it gives me a lot more personal knowledge of, of what my father-in-law went through and what other people went through in the First World War. One of the surprising things that we found in doing our genealogy, and also that's a real fun thing we feel, is that we had discovered, first of all, some of Jerry's ancestors had come to New York before the time of the American Revolution, and at the outbreak of that conflict, they became loyalists. And or they remained loyalists, perhaps we should say, with the British government. And some of those relatives joined British forces. And we did find out that that included belonging to some uh, groups under the command of gentleman Johnny Burgoyne, the British general. And he, of course, probably is best known for his fate at the Battle of Saratoga in 1777 when he did surrender to the Americans in what was considered to be probably the first real victory for the Americans, a real uplifting thing. Well, subsequently, after several years of research in my family, we knew that some of my dad's family, the Barretts, had been in Massachusetts and then into and also in New York in the same period of time and we found that one ancestor from uh, Massachusetts and another one from New York were in the Patriot Army and were at the Battle of Saratoga and so we realized that her ancestors had been there and surrendered to my ancestors <laughs> and we thought that's always a real fun kind of story. Sometimes we can laugh at what we learn. There was a period of time in the early 1800s in Scotland when they were charging to register the births. So being Scots, they didn't register the births. <laughs> but at some point later, the people who stayed in Scotland registered their births when they took the tax off. Some of us have special challenges in tracing our roots. Some of the sp uh, unique challenges of uh, researching Lebanese genealogy uh, include the most obvious is the difference in the alphabets. And in transliterating from Arabic to English, there, there are special challenges because in Arabic they don't write all the vowels. And so that leads to uh, many ways of spelling the name. My name, uh, M-I-L-K-I-E, is spelled in various family records, M-E-L-K-I, M-U-L-K-I, M-U-L-K-I-E. M-I-L-K-I, and I have first cousins that spell, still spell it, M-E-L-K-I and M-I-L-K-I. So that was part of it. Um, and then the usual uh, problems that any gene genealogists uh, run into, like misspelling or errors in transcription. Um, as an example, this is my father's high school graduation from Tripoli Boys School in Tripoli, Lebanon, back in 1937. You'll notice that the, uh, it's written in three languages, English, Arabic, and French. In the English, they have his middle initial with a J. In the Arabic, 
they have his middle name, Jibril, but that wasn't his middle name. Uh, th that means Gabriel. His middle name was Jabur, and the, uh, they just wrote the name wrong in Arabic. Uh, little things like that. We learn about ancestors we never knew and meet nice people along the way. Well, my, my uh, grandparents came to this country, uh, landed in New York, and went to Cleveland. My grandpa arrived first and went there and found work and then uh, called for my grandmother uh, to come over and uh, they settled in that area. And I could not get much information about those earlier days and so uh, this has been a lot of fun to, uh, to go back there and recreate um, their life as it was then. We found the home that, the first home that they lived in there around 1900. It's, it's still there today. We found wherever we go if you meet somebody who's interested in genealogy, it's a nice person who's very willing to share with you and uh, it's, it's a bonus for genealogists. Sometimes our family searches serve as the catalyst to reconnect with family members, long separated by time and space. And I had an ancestor uh, named Piccola and I thought Piccola, what an unusual name. I really would like to find, see if I knew Piccola was still living. Um, and, you know, just by calling people and, and, and uh, you know, asking about her, I learned a whole lot about what was going on. And the, the internet has allowed us to share pictures and, uh, and really become acquainted. Um, another thing I did was I, I sent uh, packets of pictures to people. Uh, I made a little card and I put my grandparents, uh, my great grandparents' picture in the card. And um, then I put my, um, Mater my, my grandparents in there too. And I said, these are my grandparents. I'm one of their 12 grandchildren. And uh, a lot of people remembered these grandparents because they would go there and visit. So you, you, they knew I was part of the family. Genealogy gives a whole new dimension to travel. In 1998, uh, my wife and I and a good friend went to Germany. And I was interested in finding out more about where my ancestors were born, where they lived and what they did before they came to America. And so we traveled to these small towns and we were able to locate three of the four grandparents' home sites. And um, one of the places that was very interesting was Remde, Germany, right in the heart of Germany. And the German pastor there spoke English and I was able to communicate with him and get the information I wanted on my great grandfather. We went on a, a trip uh, for genealogy we were following my Cable family, and my father had always told me that they lived in Cable's Corners near Petrolia. So we sat out in search of the Cable's Corners and, of course, couldn't find anything like that. But we were in a, a small town called Arcona, and we stopped at a restaurant for lunch, and we, were, we had all our papers out on the table, and um, we were talking about, I think, Cable's Corners and how are we going to find this, and the waitress overheard us. And she said, well, I know this woman right sitting over there could help you. Her name was Mrs. Muma, I remember. And she came over, she was about 80 at that time. And she said, oh, I can take you right there. I know exactly where Cable's Corners are. And it wasn't a town. It was just uh, where two streets, two country roads intersected and Cable's lived on the four corners. And one still lives there. In 1993, we made a trip to Scotland to visit the ancestral roots of the Arnott family. We had an appointment with the head archivist of the Argyle Butte Council. And in meeting with him, I asked him why he thought that the Arnott family would have left Scotland. And what he was told to me, he said, gee, Bruce, what you have to imagine, here's this family of 13 sitting in a croft where they where they're leasing from the Duke of Argyle. It's raining outside. The wind is blowing. The thatched roof is leaking down onto the dirt floor. The peat bog fire is wet and smoking up the entire building. It doesn't take much imagination to visualize your great-great-grandmother turning to her husband and saying, why are we staying here? We haven't had a dry stitch of clothing on the children in days, and we can't afford to pay the lease to the, to the Duke of Argyle as the crops have failed. 
let's go somewhere else where we can at least own the land that we're living on. And that's how we believe it came about that they left Scotland. We also had been doing some travel trailer uh, activities quite a long while before we got into genealogy and we felt it would be a good way to be able to go to different places to do our genealogy but also be able to use our trailer as our home which has really made it very convenient. Join the Dearborn Genealogical Society and learn more about how to discover your family's history. You'll meet friendly people and find new ways to dig into your family's past. This is a good place to come and meet new people and get new ideas and hear interesting speakers. We really got interested in belonging to the Dearborn Society when we, because we both grew up in Dearborn. And my mother's maiden name is Woodworth, and there is a connection with the Woodworth family here in Dearborn, so we have quite an interest in the local area. And we figured if we start here, at least that will get us going probably to other areas in Michigan and in other states. I joined the society, must be about I would say 15 years ago now. My husband and I both were members. He was the avid genealogist. I just came along for the ride. And as genealogy is, it tends to hook you. I have found it uh, sociably. It's a good group. The friend, people are, everyone is friendly. I enjoy coming because of that. Also, I've gotten helps from, you know, the people as to where to look and where to search. And like the papers that I brought with me are uh, an application for naturalization from my grandfather and his brother. Someone said I should look it up, which I did. And I got them from the state library. The Dearborn Genealogical Society has given me an opportunity to meet lots of people. We have a membership of, of approximately 100 people and it's, it's a nice, friendly group that, that people will help each other and our breadth of experience in this society is just fantastic and everybody's very, very friendly. Sometimes you'll even meet cousins you never knew existed. I belong to German Genealogy Society about nine or ten years possibly. And here about three or four years ago, a young lady by the name of Gail Hershon got up and said she was a guest and that she was searching the August Sylvester family of Dearborn. And that just took me by such a surprise and I just kind of waved at her and we met at the break and here she is a third cousin that I didn't even know existed. Pat G and I worked together for a long time and uh, since her last name was G, she was Mrs. G, and since my last name was Gertz, some of the students called me Mrs. G. So <laughs> we started saying that we were sisters and we'd tell the students, oh yes, my sister down the hall. Well, come to find out later on, we really are related. I went to Pat uh, because she was helping me with my genealogy and said I wanted to look into my Hool family and she knew immediately that we were related. I simply said, Hood, H-O-U-L-E, well, I'm a Hood. And so we got out our family trees, uh, French Canadian families far away from Dearborn, and we began to look and we realized that both of us descended from the pioneer in Quebec, Louis Hood. And uh, then we went a little further and you come from Etienne. Etienne, and you come from? Simon. And so uh, from going uh, colleagues in the workplace to friends, we finally established through our genealogy a familial connection that we never knew existed. So that was our big surprise. We really were related. And uh, we're cousins. We're cousins. And I say a cousin is a cousin is a cousin. We're so happy when we find information to fill in the missing pieces. Jerry Dealey learned about her Canadian great uncle on the internet. A uh, few years back, a friend of mine introduced me to the internet, and I've gone crazy since then. And on the National Canadian Archives, they have wonderful websites. They have a veteran's website, and when I searched my uncle's name, I actually came up with a copy of his enlistment papers. And these are all handwritten documents from about 1916. 
and it gave his birth date, so I filled in one mystery piece. And as I'm going along, I found a site where it listed all the soldiers that died uh, during the war. And I was actually able to visualize a book, I think it was handwritten, but it was a book of all the soldiers that had died uh, and they're part of the Canadian, or the British records. And I found his name there. And then searching more, I found a website that was dedicated to just him. And it told us when he died and where he is buried in France. It even showed us uh, the layout of the cemetery and we could zero in into the plot number. And I thought this was wonderful because it filled in all the pieces. And then it also allowed me to post his picture on there because it wasn't there. So I had these photographs and I was able to put two pictures of him with his army uniform and then in his kilt also. And so it kind of filled in those missing pieces of this jigsaw puzzle we call genealogy. The Dearborn Genealogical Society meets on the fourth Thursday of the month, September through April, at the McFadden Ross House, located at 915 Brady Street, just north of Michigan Avenue in Dearborn. The McFadden Ross House is part of the Dearborn Historical Museum. We offer outstanding programs which are worthwhile for anyone interested in genealogy or history, or any curious person who wants to learn new things. The program vice president, this year it's Betsy Cushman, selects the speakers and makes the arrangements. A recent presentation by Sharon Brevoort of Ann Arbor was called Timelines and Chronologies, placing your ancestor in historical context. The president of the Dearborn Genealogical Society conducts a brief business meeting, and of course there's always a refreshment break. The society's historian keeps records of the meetings. Every May the society holds its heritage dinner with a special meal, presentation, and publications table. The most popular publications on the table, which is staffed by Ruth Rhodes and Pat G, are the 1876 Platte Maps of the Dearborn area, three Wayne County Cemetery indexes, and two volumes of early newspaper records covering the Dearborn area. There are many benefits to joining the Dearborn Genealogical Society, and our newsletter is outstanding. As the newsletter editor, my goal is to make the newsletter informative and educational. Our website serves many purposes. Our website is very easy to access. Uh, probably the simplest way is to simply type Dearborn Genealogical Society into your search engine and the link will come up. Uh, we're also listing below the official Roots Web site and that address will be on the screen here for you. Uh, one link that people really want to look at has to do with the programs. This lists our programs for the year along with the meeting site, the time, and the date. So it's a way of knowing what's coming and uh, what you might want to be sure to put on your calendar. Um, by the way, these programs are open to the public. One other link that is uh, very helpful here has to do with our publications. Uh, they are all listed online and the directions for obtaining those through the website. One main use of our website has to do with the society research data which is recorded online. By clicking on that you'll be able to see if any of the names you're working on uh, correlate or correspond to another researcher in the group. We can hook you up and maybe get you some help on that line. Uh, we also have an index to Northview Cemetery to the names on our tombstones to be able to check and see. We also have it on for St. Alphonse Cemetery by contacting us we can give you the complete information. And finally we have online the deaths that are reported, the very early ones from the Dearborn Press and those are on for the first 10 years. I would encourage there are many other links that are helpful including research and officers and newsletter. We have lots of, of other very helpful links. Our society offers an annual bus trip to Fort Wayne, Indiana's famous genealogical library. We have the opportunity to go visit the second largest genealogical collection in the United States in Allen County Library in Fort Wayne. Uh, we do this uh, in like the first Tuesday of May and we've been doing it for about five years now. 
It's a five hour bus trip to uh, Fort Wayne. We, as a group, go down there and help each other and do, do research. And then come back in the evening on the bus and we arrive back in Dearborn about 10.30 in the evening. Genealogy is very new to me and I jumped in with two feet when I went on the bus trip down to Fort Wayne in May. I, when I got on the bus, I met a fellow member, uh, Elaine Lovelace, who I swim with. And from then on, I have been running. I've enjoyed it. I've been shown new ways to look at things and where to find them. Just sitting on the bus, listening to everybody's conversations about where they went, where they look, well, I've been here, I've been there. And then when I got to the museum, uh, Indiana, Fort Wayne, Indiana, going in that facility, the library, and Pat G helping everybody that was new and found things. And then that got me going. Then this fall I took a class at Henry Ford Community College that Pat G taught, and that steered me into where my research and helped me organize it. That was my biggest problem. I didn't know how to organize it. And that's, those things have just opened a whole new world to me and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. We are fortunate to enjoy a close relationship with the city of Dearborn, and especially the Dearborn Historical Museum. In fact, two of the city's museum curators were present at the very first meetings of the Dearborn Genealogical Society. Uh, my earliest recollections of the Genealogical Society, it had a really wonderful group of people, small but very very interested and of course they had a common goal and that was to trace their genealogy. Well, my earliest recollection would be sometime in 1965 when we started talking about possibly having a genealogical group here. It would be a very logical thing to have in the historical museum. And uh, so we talked to various people and the name Erwin Otis comes right, right in my forefront because he was very active in this organization as it got started back in, as of January, the, the first meeting January 31st, 1966, and um, he was very active, and his family was a well-known family, the Old Otis family of America. Their book was about, the family history was about that thick, and uh, he and other people were interested in doing this, and uh, we decided it would be a nice thing to do, so I, we brought it before the Historical Commission and the Historical Society, and they both sponsored it. So those were the two sponsors of this group. And I was very proud to have it happen. And I used to attend quite a few of their meetings in the, in the early days, maybe the parts of the first couple of years. And Donald Bowdier, former curator of research, who was long retired from the museum, he was involved for a number, number of years with it, came, came all the meetings. It was very, very helpful to, for us it was helpful for them because we helped, we helped them find things in the archives and they helped us get things for the archives. So it was really a, a wonderful, partnership that I, I, that's the way I would call it, a partnership. I recall some of the me members in the, um, early, the early days of the formation of the, uh, the Genealogical Society, and what I, I know one, I believe she was a secretary, Mary Hiltz, and she was a delightful person, very, and she was one of the other besides uh, Irwin, and uh, I believe, and also I believe Larry Shepard, wasn't he? Yes, yes, Larry, Larry Shepard. Shepard. Uh, mm -hmm. Who gave us the Civil yes. War flag here at the museum. He was very, very active. I, I just thought of the name, Mary. But Jeff Chandler, how about that? That's it, Jeff Chandler. Jeff Chandler. Jeff Chandler. I, I try to think of his name. He was, uh, <laughs> he was a delight, really I enjoyed him. He was from, I believe, Kentucky or uh, Tennessee, one of those states. He was a reincarnation of Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, he was like a raw, big raw bone fellow, but I, a really nice one. During those early years, there was quite a cross section of, uh, of people who belonged to this. They were older people, maybe in their 70s or older or younger, a little bit younger than that. People in their, their mid, mid 50s or people 25, 30 maybe. I was quite surprised that quite a few young people were interested in belonging to something like this. Mm -hmm. It was quite, quite nice. And of course, people like Pat G stands out. And to this day, she's very active in the organization, I know, but she was a, a live wire there. I would like to also make the comment that I think it's one of the finest organizations we have here, and as, I, as we have mentioned earlier, who have contributed so much to making this museum uh, 
uh, better and uh, having great records of people who lived in Dearborn and of the cemetery records and uh, they've done extensive work and so we're very proud of them and proud to have them here. I would just like to mention that during the, the years when I was here, I was very proud to have them come in. We've had many nice organizations come into this group, but, but this is really one that just tied into our, our museum work, you know, to be involved with genealogy. It's very, very important. The museum archives at the McFadden Ross House can be very helpful to the family historian. We have a lot of resources available to uh, genealogical researchers here at the archives. Um, these resources include uh, Dearborn newspapers, go back to 1905. Most of those newspapers are completely indexed, especially where obituaries are concerned and, you know, um, individuals are, are concerned. Um, we also have uh, tax records um, going back quite some ways, both for uh, Dearborn Township as well as Springwells and Fordson. We also have church records here in the archives, both on microfilm um, and, and also cemetery records. Um, we have family papers here uh, that include things like journals. We have a, a, a very large selection of photographs. Um, there are a lot of people that come here looking for photographs of their ancestors and so forth. The Society has a genealogical library on the third floor of the Henry Ford Centennial Library, named for a past DGS president, Yulon Smith. Stephanie Herm is our Society's librarian, in charge of keeping these resources in order. This is the Yulon Smith Memorial Collection, and it's also informally known as the DGS Library. We have a variety of um, categories. They are outlined here. There are a lot of resources for people doing genealogical research. The Dearborn Public Library allows cardholders to access Ancestry.com's library edition online. Here is Tara Ganau, Administrative Librarian. Let me show you how this works. You start by clicking on Online Resources, and then you go to the Ancestry Library Edition. The Ancestry Library Edition um, gives you a great many different resources. Some of the resources that you can see right on its home page are just a general search screen for your ancestors, um, which will give you a start. It also gives the U.S. Census and it gives more collections. Now, the more collections is probably what most people are going to want and they're going to probably click on um, databases and this will list all of the databases that are in AncestryLibrary.com um, so there are Ancestry databases for individual families, um, for places, um, for areas, for groups um, just the way the books upstairs on the second floor use indexes, the Ancestry Library Edition also uses indexes. And you can get into these um, databases simply by clicking on them. Um, there's also a group of databases on the side that can be very useful for you. For example, the New York Passenger Lists. A great many people like to see the passenger lists. Um, those give you the option of searching by names, by the port of departure, by the port of arrival, by the name of the ship, by the origin um, of the ship. Um, so there are a lot of options on the passenger ship indexes. Society members range from beginners to advanced researchers and we all like to help each other. All over the country are these family history centers. They are uh, located in the Mormon churches and uh, they're open to the public. Anyone can go there that wants to and do research. They have computers, they have film readers, they have fish, and they have all kinds of books. I mean, anything you would find in a normal genealogy library. Well, I did, um, was a librarian at the Family History Center. Uh, people who have come to the Genealogy Club, I've met them at the library and tried to guide them. Not a great 
informative, <laughs> but uh, I uh, have taken them and helped them search and introduce them to the librarian. Storytelling, keeping our family stories alive is part of our mission and so much fun. Here are some of our stories. Name Marie came from my two grandmothers. My grandmother Marie Siobhan was born in Berlin and even though she has a French name, born in Berlin, her ancestors came all the way from Paris because the Berliners wanted to be as fashionably dressed as the Parisians, so they imported her relatives, her ancestors who were seamstresses and tailors. And that's how she got to be born in Berlin. My other grandmother was from um, Binsbach by Ansbach in uh, Bavaria. Her family, they were Huguenots, and after Martin Luther's time, they were all the Huguenots in France were persecuted and their lives were threatened. So the king of Franconia offered them um, haven in Franconia and they crossed the French Alps and settled in little towns south of Nuremberg. And even though Bavaria is Catholic, these are all Lutheran towns still there today. And my grandmother's name was Marie. And, and then there was a story one time that was well known at the Sioux that grandfather was taking a man from the jail at the Sioux to the train uh, to go to prison. He apparently had not been searched well. He was handcuffed in front. And as they were walking down the street to the train, he bent over and pulled out of his boot what they called a boot gun, actually a two-shot Derringer. And he bent down and began to run. The children were just getting out of school and he was mixing with the children and grandfather, having drawn his gun, could not get a shot off. He shot at grandfather one time and he hit him in his watch pocket, destroying the watch, knocking the wind out of him, but he still kept coming after him. Grandfather was carrying a cane, and he had it up like this as he was running down the street, and the second shot split the cane in two, or it would have taken him right in the head. And as he, as he turned the corner to get away, Grandfather had a clear shot, and he aimed his 44, and bam! He says, well, I got him. And he went around, and there was nobody there. He looked all over the place to try and find this man, and he couldn't find him, and he came home and he said, Charlotte, I hit him, I know I hit him, and I can't find him. Two days later, a man went down his basement and found the man laying there dead. Grandfather got him all right. He hit him and he rolled in through the basement window and the window closed after him and no one could find him. So that was a grand story that we used to enjoy hearing many times. Genealogists are the keepers of the family stories for future generations. We do this in many ways. The videotaping project was a gift to me from a friend of my family and also one of my, one of my daughters. And they decided after many years of having the data, that is the raw information, put on charts that it, it would make a story if we videotaped it. I had already written the Red Book, but this is a, 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 the next step to make a live video of how I did it and what I included in the video. It's a complete history of my four great-grandparents and also includes a lot of old pictures. Uh, and this is an example, this is what was actually produced and it's called Tapestries, The Sure Family Legacy. And it's a 25-minute video. Now each member of my family has one and I'd like to say that it's been very well received. I would recommend that everybody doing family research, once they get the, ba the basic data, uh, names, places, uh, dates, all of that information, then to put it into a form where, every, where it's available to everybody in, in one simple context. In other words, I like to call it putting flesh on the bones of your ancestors. So you don't look at a chart, you look at the video which includes everything. If you only look at a chart, there's no story with it. It's just facts and figures. But to develop a story, you have to put it down either in a written document or a video 
so that everybody can see the same information. My autobiography was started about um, roughly a year ago. Bill Clinton had written a book about his life. And I recall an interview he had where he said, it's very important for parents to write about their, their early life so that their children understand. Most time, you know, you don't discuss that. From a certain point on, you know what your parents have done. But before that, you have no history. One of my new skills that I've been learning since I've been doing genealogy is to try to make little stories that will be passed on and hopefully really interesting to somebody in the future generations. I've got seven grandchildren. Hopefully somebody will um, enjoy them and will take up that gauntlet of interest in the family. I think genealogy just adds a whole new dimension to my life and so much fun and I hope to my future um, generations too.